Now we're here, we are in the last lecture before your exam. You have two parts, 4.1 and 4.2. Since you do have two uh, chapters plus an exam uh, this week, I want to try to keep this brief. But uh, this chapter, chapter 5, and chapter 6 are both topics that I enjoy a lot. So I will try to keep this brief and efficient. In this chapter, we are going to learn why photosynthesis is important. Uh, some of the different types of photosynthetic organisms that I'm going to share with you, a really weird one, as quick as I can. We'll also talk just a little bit about energy, uh, and we'll spend some time talking about how the process of photosynthesis converts energy using um, sunlight to make organic molecules with chemical energy stored. So I'm not going to delve into biofuels, because I think your book does this just fine. Uh, but I am going to talk a little bit about how carbon cycles on Earth and why sustainability is important. We'll talk more about that in Unit 4 when we talk about sustainability. We need to know a little bit about energy before we go on to talk about photosynthesis. As we defined in Chapter 4 with nutrition, energy is the ability to do work. Also, energy is conserved, meaning that it can't be created and it can't be destroyed. Now, if you do have a solid background in physics, you know that this isn't always a true statement. But in biological systems, energy remains and it is conserved, so we're just going to keep it simple. Um, but energy can be converted to other forms. I like to summarize it like this. This is my idea. Energy flows through systems because energy, for example, used in photosynthesis, it doesn't originate on Earth, and energy can leave Earth as well. So energy can be gained from outside of whatever system you're talking about, um, and energy can be lost from a system, usually in what we're going to talk about as heat, which is still energy but it's free to leave the system. In contrast, matter has to cycle within a system. It's also conserved, uh, but it doesn't leave the system in any significant amounts. There are two broad forms of energy. We have potential energy and kinetic energy. Potential energy is basically the stuff that's ready to do work. So chemical energy, uh, which is what we talked about with nutrition and what we're going to talk about a lot here is the example of potential energy. Uh, gravitational energy is also a form of potential energy. And then kinetic energy is energy of movement. Right? So we'll talk about light energy. We're talking about photosynthesis. Again, I mentioned heat is also kinetic energy. Uh, so to illustrate the conversion of energy from potential to kinetic and back again, I want you to imagine holding uh, a like a bowling ball or a wrecking ball, something on a chain. You hold it right in front of your nose. At the point that you're holding it, all the energy in that ball is potential energy. It's not moving yet, but there's a lot of gravitational energy ready to pull it down. As you release the ball, it begins to swing away from your nose. While it's swinging, the potential energy is being converted into kinetic energy. It gains velocity, it gains speed at the very bottom of the arc, let me draw a little picture here, so you've got a, a ball on a string, you let go of it, and it arcs down like this. At the very bottom of the arc, all of the energy is kinetic, it's just moving to the side, it doesn't have any potential energy, but then it immediately starts to convert back uh, to potential energy as it gains elevation here again, and then it stops. At that point that it stops right here, all of its energy is potential again. Now it isn't moving for like a split second. Then it swings back the other way, again converting potential and kinetic. The sum of those two energies remains the same. Now a little bit will be lost because unless you're doing this in a vacuum, there's air resistance and some of that energy is used to shove the air out of the way and with that very minimal amount of friction it actually heats up the air just a little bit. So there's some loss, eventually it will lose its energy and stop swinging back and forth and just be a ball hanging on a chain. So what you can do is you can stick your face right in front of this ball, let go of it, and then have it come back and not break your nose. It's kind of fun. 
Uh, I've enlisted a friend of mine, Neil deGrasse Tyson, my favorite person, uh, even though I've never met him. But I do have a friend who's met him. But he's going to show you this example, the wrecking ball. Check this out. So it swings, it's converting energy, it comes back, and he's unharmed. Boop. I love that. That's from Cosmos, by the way, which if you haven't seen it, uh, it's on Netflix. Check it out. It's the greatest. Okay, so you already know that you get your energy from your food, but where does your food get its energy from? Now, at some point, there is a bottom of the food web. Even if you're eating a steak, the cow had to get its energy from somewhere. Uh, at the very bottom of a food web or a food chain are autotrophs. These are primary producers, which, again, we'll talk more about, but these are terms that most of you are familiar with. So um, these autotrophs are uh, organisms that make their own food from energy, okay? They convert... In the case of photosynthesizers, they convert uh, light energy from sunlight or even an artificial light bulb. Uh, they convert it into chemical energy by going through this process called photosynthesis. Um, it's kind of neat. There are some other autotrophs called chemosynthesizers. I might have mentioned this. But anyways, these are uh, microorganisms, bacteria, I think some phytoplankton that live at the very bottom of deep sea hydrothermal vents. There's no sunlight down there, uh, but there's a thriving ecosystem based on this chemosynthesis. These microorganisms use uh, chemicals spewing out of the hydrothermal vents to power the conversion um, of carbon into these organic molecules, which are then used for food. And then, you know, things eat those microorganisms and in turn get eaten. And so there's a whole completely independent food web at the bottom of the oceans, which is pretty cool. But anyways, more familiar to you, you got plants, algae, and of course, cyanobacteria I've mentioned. Uh, what these guys do is they capture uh, light energy, like I said, from sunlight, and they use it to power this photosynthetic process to make uh, glucose usually. Now, this glucose can be used for three different things. It can be used right away for energy, just right off the bat, boom. That's why they're autotrophs, they make their own food. It can be stored, like as uh, if in the case of a plant, starches like in potatoes and carrots, or as oils like in olives. Um, it can also be used to make cell structures like the cell wall in plants. So something really fun uh, was discovered actually a while ago. There's this slug, this sea slug that lives off the coast of Canada. It's called Alicia chlorotica, uh, and it's this bright green color. That's why they call it that chloro -like color. And we associate it with chlorophyll, which is a green pigment I'll talk about. What this sea slug does is it eats algae, okay? like a lot of sea slugs do, but this one steals the chloroplasts from the algal cells themselves and put it, it puts the chloroplasts into its epidermis, into its skin, and it can live for months at a time when food is very scarce just off of these chloroplasts and the molecules that they produce. Uh, and they didn't really know how these slugs did that until very recently because uh, chloroplasts, remember we talked about how chloroplasts are descended from free-living bacteria, uh, which, you know, three or four billion years ago were fine functioning on their own, but after three or four billion years of living inside of a cell, they've lost a lot of their own genes, so they can no longer live without their host cell, uh, and they'll degrade. They, they don't have the genes to make the proteins to repair themselves, so it was weird that the slug can keep these chloroplasts uh, repaired and functioning for so long. And what they realized more recently with uh, new molecular techniques is that the slugs also steal genes from the algae. Uh, this is a process called horizontal gene transfer. And it was thought up until very recently that it only occurred in things like bacteria. Uh, they didn't think it happened in animals, but now we know that it does and they're finding more instances of it. It's very cool, it's very weird, uh, but that's a different story.
Your book skims over very quickly the processes involved in photosynthesis. I want to add just a little bit more detail so we can talk about some more stuff. So photosynthesis, like your book uh, does, it can be conceptually organized into two different steps or reactions. So this photo step, step that your book talks about is also called the light dependent reactions. These are um, reactions that can only occur in the presence of light. So either sunlight or, you know, like a grower's lamp or something. Um, okay, what happens here is light particles or photons strike the chlorophyll, which is a pigment in the chloroplasts, uh, and it excites electrons in this chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is kind of fun. We all know that plants are green, uh, and the reason for that is because chloroplasts, the, the electrons in chloro, uh, chlorophyll, my bad, the pigment specifically, chloroplast is the organelle, chlorophyll is the pigment. Um, but the electrons are excited best by certain colors of light. Colors are uh, different energy wavelengths of different colors of light. That's what colors are, which is neat. So only bluish, violetish light and red light are actually absorbed into the chlorophyll. Green light is actually rejected or reflected off of the chlorophyll. And that's why when you see a plant, that's the green light coming in and being reflected out and hitting your eye and your brain registers that as green. It's kind of neat. Anyways, this light energy, blue, violet, and red uh, light, it excites electrons. They bounce around through this thing called the electron transport chain. We denote um, electrons as this E minus, this E negative, because electrons carry a negative charge. It's no, bit, no problem, right? Uh, those excited electrons bounce around. They have a lot of energy. They're high energy because they were just hit by a photon, which was absorbed, and that light energy was turned into this kinetic energy of moving, bouncing, uh, excited electrons. That energy is used to split water. So here we see water coming into the chloroplast. These electrons are in the, the membrane, the internal membrane of the chloroplast. Um, and so then it splits out that water. The plant kicks out oxygen, which forms O2 gas and is just Lit out into the atmosphere and it holds on to the hydrogen atoms. Those hydrogen atoms are very important because they're used to uh, power the production of ATP, which we'll talk a whole lot more about in chapter six and 4.2 lecture. And also they're stuck onto this molecule called NADP plus to form NADPH. I don't care if you remember that. The important thing is the hydrogens here stuck on and you can think of this hydrogen as a carrier for electrons. And so both of these molecules are now storing chemical energy. But we want this plant to be able to construct some actual larger organic molecules for storage or to be broken down again in other cells or whatever, right? Plants want to be versatile. So next, what happens are the light independent reactions or the synthesis step is what your book calls it. Now this light independent reaction, it can occur at the same time as light dependent reactions or it can occur at night. Different plants do it different ways. What happens here is carbon dioxide is captured by the plant. It's brought into the leaf through a structure called a stomata, which is Latin for stomach or mouth, I think, actually. So it looks like a mouth on a leaf. Uh, so it opens up. Carbon dioxide is brought into the leaf. And then from there, it can enter cells and from the cells into the chloroplast. So it's carbon dioxide at this point. Now, the ATP and NADPH, those storage molecules of just a little bit of chemical energy, they're used to build that CO2 up into glucose, which is C6H12O6 is kind of the root structure of that. This is called carbon fixation. And now you've got a lot more chemical energy that you can do more stuff with. I wanted you to have that additional bit of detail because carbon is so incredibly important for all biological processes and in our global system. Now, being matter, 
carbon cycles throughout global systems. It's conserved within the system and it doesn't leave and we don't get more. Um, the entire Earth contains of several independent systems itself, but carbon cycles throughout those. So the biosphere is all the living organisms on Earth. Carbon exists in the biosphere as organic molecules, of course, and also some inorganic molecules like uh, calcium carbonate, which is what seashells are made of. The atmosphere, I'm sure you've heard of that, it's the gaseous layer around the Earth. Uh, carbon exists here as carbon dioxide, which is inorganic, and methane, which is organic. Uh, I'm just kind of reinforcing the term organic here. You don't need to care which is which. Um, or you know what's in each sphere but the carbon in the atmosphere is minuscule it makes up less than one percent of the total of the atmosphere uh, but it has a huge effect because both carbon dioxide and especially methane and there are a couple others too they're extremely powerful greenhouse gases so again that's a conversation for another day um, but i want you to be aware of it and then there's the lithosphere, okay? The lithosphere is all the soil and rocks um, in the crust of the earth. Let me draw a cycle for this. I'm gonna use A for atmosphere, makes sense, right? B is the biosphere. Now what we just learned is that carbon can move from the atmosphere to the biosphere through photosynthesis, carbon fixation. Uh, as organisms die, they decay and enter the lithosphere. So this includes organic carbon in the soil. It also includes uh, things like coal and oil. All right, that's very, very important uh, because where that coal and oil came from is not dinosaurs. I know you've heard that it's not dinosaurs. It's from a lot longer before dinosaurs existed, Some a period of time called the Carboniferous period. This was about 300 million years ago. Uh, this is around the time that an enzyme called lignin, not an enzyme, a protein, uh, but not an enzyme, called lignin evolved. Uh, lignin is in the cell walls of modern trees and other like woody shrubs and things. And it makes the cell wall of a plant a lot more rigid, which allows these plants to grow a lot larger and taller. Uh, and with that, there became a huge advantage if you're a tree that now can grow taller than all the grasses and ferns and things. Actually, grass didn't exist yet. Ferns <laughs> around you, um, you got all the sunlight and you were king, so you reproduced a lot. And so now all of a sudden forests evolved. They had never existed before. Huge swaths of woody, um, lignin-rich uh, cell walls. Now, this is also before the enzyme, this time ligase, uh, which is present in decomposers like uh, bacteria and fungi, mostly. Uh, ligase is used to digest lignin. It hadn't evolved yet. Lignin had only been around for a short amount of time. So these forests were not decomposing, which means that the carbon from the lithosphere and the soil was not entering back into the biosphere through these uh, decomposers. And it also wasn't uh, being respirated, which we'll talk about in chapter six, but in those um, decomposers, they can respirate it and enter it back into the atmosphere from the biosphere. So we have these huge deposits of fossil fuels they're called fossil fuels because they are the remnants of living organisms, but again, not dinosaurs. And what we've started doing is taking all that carbon and burning it and shoving it into the atmosphere in enormous quantities. All of this carbon, that's a lovely arrow, hadn't existed before. What I'm trying, oh, I think I have a thicker pen that I can use to really show this. A lot of carbon that we're dumping in compared to what the normal balance was. Now, normally this carbon cycles just fine. There will be some cycling from the lithosphere to the atmosphere, um, from the biosphere to the atmosphere as we do cellular respiration, which again, you learn about um, next time. 
And so there's a very, very nice balance normally. And this balance was shifted during the Carboniferous when a lot of carbon dioxide was fixed from the atmosphere and stuck into the lithosphere until humans came around 300 million years later, and now we've dumped a whole bunch of it back into the atmosphere. When this happened during the Carboniferous period, well, when uh, this part happened, a whole lot of photosynthesis happened, and then it didn't decompose, so it went this way. It, a ton of carbon was brought out, but it took a very, very, very long time. And we saw some cool things happening in the biosphere, like insects got huge. You've heard of like the eagle-sized dragonflies, maybe? That was during this time because now there was so much more oxygen because all of that oxygen was being released by the trees and the forests and carbon was being fixed. So the climate changed a whole lot and insects were able to grow incredibly large, but it took a very long time. So there was time, there was a lot of time for adaptations. What we're doing now with this big dumping of all this carbon back into the atmosphere is happening way too rapidly. And so our climate is changing faster than organisms can adapt and can evolve. That we will come back to. Um, that's a conversation that I'll probably bring up a lot, but that's how it happens. Um, so, what I hope you got from this chapter, I hope I didn't go off on too many tangents. Energy is conserved, but it can be transferred between different types by photosynthetic organisms. Um, these are autotrophs, they include plants, algae, and bacteria, and some weird slugs and stuff. Um, I want you to know that word carbon fixing or carbon fixation. Now, obviously, I can keep going, but you guys have more work to do. So uh, from here, go ahead and read chapter six, watch lecture 4.2, which will be over chapter six, uh, and then you'll go on from there.